Yeah. So welcome everyone um, to this session of the Dunhuang and Silk Road seminars. And uh, tonight we are uh, very glad to have um, Dr. Erica Hunter as our uh, presenter. Uh, she's an affiliated researcher at our faculty. So the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies here in Cambridge. Um, and until 2020, she was senior lecturer in Eastern Christianity at SOAS. And she's led uh, two major uh, HRC grants on Syriac ma uh, manuscripts. And she's one of the most recognized um, authorities in the field of um, Syriac Christianity. And today she's going to talk to us about um, Syriac prayer amulets from Turfan, looking at both their form and their function. So please welcome uh, Dr. Hunter. Well, thank you, Imre. Thank you. Now, I share screen, don't I? Yes. yes. Right. Okay. Uh, right. Share. Right. Um, play from the start. Okay. As, 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 uh, Professor Columbus has, has said, my title today is Prayer Amulets from Torfan Form and Function. Now, um, I am just trying to get the, um, Kelsey, I can't get the, the ones you move forward. Yeah, can't move it. I think you just click on the screen. Ah, ah. Indeed. Right. Okay. So the Turfan Oasis, just for those who don't know, there are many people here who are much more familiar with it than me, of course, was, um, uh, it's 150 kilometers southeast of Urumqi, where this arrow going up is basically where Turfan is. It is now, of course, located in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Province of Western China. And between 1904 and uh, 1907, the second and third German uh, Turfan expeditions found the monastery site at, of Bulayik, which, uh, and they found amongst many, many other finds, uh, about 500 and 19 Syriac fragments from a single location. But we don't really have, a, that's a shortcoming, but it was a ubiquitous shortcoming of the time. People didn't pay attention to provenance. We don't have details of the fine spots, but von Lecoq in his monograph of Hilas Spuren in Ost-Turkistan, page 88, simply noticed he excavated in the extremely ruined walls an amazing Christian manuscript. And I've just got a photo of how high the walls stand. And of course, the most recent news is that in uh, released by the Chinese in December of 2021 is that they have uh, commenced excavations on this site um, and, and they will continue to excavate another season, so I'm told. Now the manuscripts range in size from postage size scraps to bifolia. The largest discovery was 61 folios, uh, MIK 345, which was deposited in, in, in Dalam. And there are no colophons to any of the material, which is of course a shortcoming, but the material I must emphasize as we will see is only fragmentary. Um, but the MIK 345 manuscript, which Chip Coakley and I published, a Syriac service book, was carbon-14 dated to 771 to 884. I won't go into that any further, but, um, the, but th th that's some of the material from Turfan. Now, um, commenting on the genres of manuscript, von Lecoq was again very economic. He says, quote, 
Finally, numerous liturgical and other manuscripts of the Nestorians in Syriac speech and script were found. So apart from the site of Bulayik or Zipan, as the Chinese now term it, and my pronunciation is probably very corrupt, uh, smaller quantity, which was where majority were found, smaller quantities of Syriac fragments were found at several other sites in the oasis at Astana, Kocho, Kurutka, and Toyuk. And this is going to be significant in the material I discussed. Now, of course, the Germans were not the only players in the game. Nikolai Krotkov, the Russian consul at Urumqi, obtained Syriac manuscripts from Torfan, including one from Astana, and also from Karakoto um, in Inner Mongolia in the late 19th century. And these were sent to St. Petersburg to the Institution of Oriental Studies at the Russian Academy of Sciences. Sergei Malov acquired some Syriac manuscripts between 1913 and 1915. On the Japanese front, and this will be particularly important for us, we have Count Otani Kozui, an abbot from Kyoto, a Buddhist, privately funded three expeditions to Buddhist sites, but he also found three fragments, and these are now housed at the Ryukoku, Ryukoku University in Kyoto, uh, in Kyoto. So we have um, an international uh, assemblage of material, which I will come back to. Uh, now, the Syriac... Um, uh, fr uh, fragments. This is just a recap. Many of you will know this material, but just for those who are coming into the, the field, uh, are housed in various repositories in Berlin. And um, they, the Syriac fragments were catalogued by myself and Mark Dickens. You can see the, the publication 2014. And this identified for the first time what the whole, the overall, um, what the, all the material was. There had been previously cherry picking publications of important material, but to get an overview, one needs to identify and catalogue. I will say not publish. I mean, many, many texts remain to be published. Some of the Russian material has been described. We have a uh, um, Pigolevskaya, uh, her catalogue in 1960, and Meshuskaya, her, 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 her article that was published in 1998. And uh, that includes um, 97 fragments of one liturgical text, the Gaza, uh, which Krotkov found at Torfan in 1911. The Otani collection is the subject of uh, a forthcoming publication by Hitemi Takahashi. So the Berlin material has been catalogued. Much of the St. Petersburg material has not been catalogued. And so we still have a lacuna in the field, uh, which could have uh, implications. Very high concentration of liturgical materials approximately 75 to 80% of the Berlin Petersburg collections, many exemplars of the major liturgical books, the, um, the Hudra, the Gaza, etc. lectionaries, some of them are bilingual, Syriac Sogdian, Psalters, translated into an array of languages, and uh, you can see their Sogdian, New Persian, Middle Persian. That reflects the outreach and the communities to whom the church ministered. And calendrical tables, which we've got up here, 69, Syriac HT69, which puzzled us at first. Mark and I did puzzle over it, but Mark eventually cracked it. And um, we, we determined that they were calendars to calculate the dates of feasts in the liturgical year, which, of course, are movable. There are other genres, hagiographies, surprisingly few. Marba Shaba, the purported founder of the church at Marv, and St. George, who is also found in Sogdian and Uyghur. So George is very popular. 
pedagogical materials include a dialogue between a Christian and a Jew. And I have put an excerpt of Syriac HT 94, uh, where the scribe, and I love this human error, has got confused and he's written that the Jews said, and it should have been that the Christian said, or vice versa, that the Christian said when it should have been the Jew. And you can see the corrections in the manuscript. This was not an actual meeting. It was a pedagogical text to discuss aspects of the Trinity. And we have pharmaceutical recipes for hair treatments. Um, and um, these were published, have been published and very curious um, assortment of ingredients. I'm not sure I would want to apply such uh, treatments to my hair, to my head. Some of the manuscripts, some of the manuscripts include mouse droppings. Well, there you are. So, um, and something of bulls, but we don't know what it is. I've circled the bulls in red. So there's a variety of materials from Bulaic, but I want to concentrate now on the prayer amulet. So just to give you an overview and a, of the material. We have prayer amulets that are divided into um, two formats. We have the scroll, actually it should be, uh, I have just, uh, it should be a strip, strip and codex. And I'll explain why I have changed my ideas from scroll to strip a little later in the talk. We have from uh, the Syriac HT um, 99 and Syriac HT 102 were both found at Bulaik, as was, uh, or the, the, the site of Zipang, which the Chinese are now excavating, and in 364 to 5. Uh, HT at manuscripts in the, um, um, uh, 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 the, the state, Bibli state library in Berlin, the N364 to 5 is in the Torfan for Sean. I have put into brackets N396 Paradise also in the Tour Fun for sure. From, uh, from, um, from uh, Kyoto, which is O-T-R-Y, and I will refer to that as Kyoto, 1789, we have a strip amulet. We also have a Hermitage uh, strip amulet, which originally came from Berlin as the mark D2134 tells us. There is a story behind this. You can read it in the uh, uh, article by Dickens and Smilova as to this is a well-traveled um, <laughs> uh, uh, artifact. Now, the scroll amulet has a, uh, uh, or the strip format has a wider distribution covering monasteries and surrounding, uh, surrounding areas. Uh, N364 to 5, according to the Turfan uh, documentation, was found in the foothills near to the monastery, whereas Syriac HT99 was found in the monastery. The uh, Ultani manuscript is found in an unidentified location at Turfan, and the Hermitage material was found by von Lecoq in Gaochang, but he doesn't tell us where. And there is, of course, for those who know, a nice view of Gaochang to give you a size of a quite considerable city. So we have, we have more scroll amulets than we do in codex form or prayer amulets. Now let's have a look at some of these uh, prayer amulets were dedicated to specific saints. Um, Syriac HT330 names Martamzis, the martyr, and it quotes John 1 to 2. And um, this was a very exciting find because it was joined to Syriac HT99. And we, we, all, we, we, catalogued all the manuscripts in a sequential order. So we had catalogued 99 a long time before we came to 330. 
But then we realized that these were two fragments that were dislocated join. You can see, and I'll come back to that later, that 99 has been cut down and trimmed. But the text read from the anathema of Ma Tamzis, and you can read uh, what um, lines three to 10. And um, this is here, but this uh, formula up here does clearly tell us that it is the anathema of Ma Tamzis. It names the saint. Um, and just to look at the other side, um, because this will be something we will return to again, the, uh, the, 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 the verso side is illustrated with a cross, very crudely drawn, but it's clear that it was folded. And of course, uh, that's going to be something we will also discuss. Um, but it's, it demarcated this item as belonging to the Church of the East. You have the lovely incised cross from the Zian Fustili uh, on the left-hand side. From Now, the second, uh, another amulet that is named for a saint is that of Cyprian Marcoprina. We have, uh, we have Syriac HT 102, found in the second Tour de France season at Bulaik, and um, it features the anathema of Mars, uh, uh, Mars Cyprian or Cuprina, and here you have the text uh, which clearly names um, uh, uh, Mars Cyprian. The first line um, is in rubric and that appears to be the end of a preceding, uh, preceding contents, uh, forever, amen. But then outlined in the red is the anathema of Marco Prina. Um, we have a Sogdian fragment in 396, which mentions the anathema of Mar Cyprian and Nicholas Sims Williams published this. Um, but it is actually an exemplar of the anathema of paradise, which is a subject I have written about this elsewhere, but it talks about the anathema of Mar Cyprian. So the anathema of Mar Cyprian is well known at the Torophon, either actually or, uh, or, or by reference. Um, then having a look, at N 364 to 365 in Torrefan Forschung and the TVB it says Torrefan Vorberger. So it was found in the foothill north of the monastery. And the location is very important for when we're discussing usage, etc. Again, small, um, two small fragments that were, uh, were able, uh, that, that formed a dislocated join. The intermediate portions are frustratingly lost. And what is curious about this, uh, this, uh, this strip is that each word, and it was, it was a unique feature in the entire catalog, each word was separated by a red dot. Extremely useful for reading, of course, the text. One wishes scribes did that more because you know yourselves that you puzzle over which is the end of the word and the beginning of the next word. Um, the Syriac text again names uh, Marco Prina. Again, you can see it in red. Um, it's not very clear, but it is, it's enough to be there. Again, saying that the saint who was celebrated in the world, etc., talks about his, and the, the black line. Um, I, I've got this drawing mechanism on my computer, which I've been using to good effect. I don't know how good you'll think it is, but the black line differentiates the actual text of Mark Prina, anathema to Mark Prina, from proper from later editions, and so it shows that this this fragment was reused several times. We have um, two lines of Sogdian text. Then we have seven lines of Syriac text, which by, by the contents are liturgical. And then there is a Sogdian text on the recto 
of the um, of the fragment, and you will notice that it was glassed up. Uh, the, the glass numbers are upside down because the fragment was glassed upside down. But never mind. The upper and the left margin are intact, and uh, so we we have a good idea of this uh, manuscript. And that's just a Syriac text for those who are interested later on. Now, both H102 102 and F364 to 5 use the title of Anathema to Mark Kuprina. And the differing text of the two exemplars indicate that they are, uh, they are different versions of the Anathema. So they're not. One can't say that one, you know, perhaps the strip was a copy from the codex. That, that just doesn't work out, but they share overall defining similarities. They mention the celebration of the saint, which is the martyrdom at which he point he utters the prayer. And that is the defining feature of an anathema. And they specify he directed his mind to God, but they use different words for mind. So it, it's quite interesting. There are similarities and yet there are enough disparities. They, of course, have different formats, the strip scrolls and the codex. Now, a third anathema, possibly to Mark Kuprina, has been identified by Hidemi Takahashi as one of the three fragments of the Otani collection. Uh, we don't know the location. He, uh, and his discussion and translation is forthcoming in the book by, um, edited by Li Tang and Dietmar Winkler. Let's have a look. And here it is, uh, um, 13 lines of text on both sides. And the verso, you can see, he says, and as he was commemorated in this world, he requested uh, from God, and he granted him his request as saying, uh, and on the holy day uh, of Sunday on which all hideous, evil and hateful deeds are dissolved, passed away and are annulled. And then we turn and, and I will go show you um, on the next slide. Uh, how it's turned over, in the name of I am who I am, and the angel Rabiel, who is the head of all angels, all fevers and all shivers, and these evil and accursed spirits, and by the power of his Lord, I drive you away, O evil spirit, do not fall upon so-and-so because I have authority over him. Takahashi is a very fine scholar, but he didn't translate the last line, which is forever, amen. Now, um, so it's a bespoke uh, and we have, of course, uh, looking at it and I compare it, you can see the red line shows uh, how the, the, the scribe simply turned the, the, the strip over. And so what is the bottom of the recto becomes the top of the verso. Syriac HD 99 was cut down from a larger piece, um, but um, the Otani fragment is written bespoke on that, on that strip. Um, we ask whether line 13 uh, amen at the lower margin of the end is actually the end of the uh, amulet. But anyway, um, I think that it probably is. Of course, the deterioration of the line, the last four lines on the verso don't allow us. Whoops, now how do I go back? Um, little arrow at the bottom. Ah, yes, right. Um, the, 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 the deterioration of these lines don't allow us to ascertain the contents of the verso. But again, we see we have the, the straight lines of the margins. It does show, unlike Syriac HT 99, where it's clearly cut down from a larger text because the sentences are incomplete, we have a complete text. Whether there was a uh, further, where the red lines are, whether the, I think we do have the extent of the text here, but whether the lines extended, whether the strip extended further and might have included the, 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 the title 
of the um, manuscript uh, of the amulet is unknown. So it doesn't actually name uh, Cyprian. It doesn't give us any uh, name. And so we don't actually know whether it is belonging to Mark Cyprian or that it is using text that is um, that, that that is of the same genre as Mar Cyprian. Let's go back a, a minute or two. Here we have, and as he was celebrated in this world, and he requested from God, and he granted his request, um, so, saying on the holy day of Sunday. Now that's a very formulaic phrase. So it is, of course, we do have this in the Tuma uh, Cyprian amulets, but it may not be something that is absolutely specific to this saint. We just don't know. So uh, it, it doesn't name him. Uh, I'm going to slip, slip there. So um, Takahashi points out the similarity of the Otani uh, strip to uh, uh, Syriac HT 102 uh, and N364. When he was celebrated in this world, he sought from God and he granted his request. And when he said, uh, so on the holy day of Sunday, when by it were destroyed, overturned, and voided all evil, vile, and odious ones. Well, um, uh, uh, here we can add N364 to 365 because again, and it is of course named after Mar Cyprian, he says by the prayer of the saint who as he was celebrated in this world, he requested from our Lord Jesus Christ and he gave. And um, the red, the green shows us because I'm not sure how that appears on your screen, is, of course, Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the red is, is by the prayer of the saint, he who, as he was celebrated. So, uh, just to, so um, in, in the Otani fragment, we have, of course, actions, um, the, uh, and also in Syriac HT 102, we have a, a similar concatenation of actions against malevolent deeds. And the both of them use three verbs, similar verbs, dissolved, pass away, annulled. I have used Takahashi's translation. I have translated those verbs as destroyed, overturned and voided that they are the same verbs and of course directed towards the same uh, malevolence uh, forces we should say it actually is de uh, deeds because the of there which you can see if I can get my cursor down to um, can, Kelsey can I uh, yes, uh, just want to get the cursor down um, if on the left hand side you can see the word avde and then bishe and, uh, uh, and shakire, so all hideous, evil, and hate, and, and then next line, of course, which isn't on the screen, hateful deeds. And the same happens in um, Syriac HT 102, lines five to six, and you see, can see more clearly uh, evil. Uh, vile and odious. I have used slightly different words. So it, it's again, the, these actions are directed against deeds um, that are considered to be uh, malevolent in nature. Um, so what is interesting is that Syriac HT 102 and then 364 to 5 don't have any personal element. The agency is transferred to God and the saint, and that's the, the way the formula is. Um, and Syriac HT 102 recto says um, he holds line two, he holds all and rules all by the power of his name, etc., etc., and then by N364 to 5, by the power of the saint. Um, so 
the, the agency belongs with the, the divine, whereas in in, in, in Otani, um, the Otani fragment, the, there is there is a difference as we will come along, and the angel, and we will see in a minute because the angelic elements are not present in Syriac HT one o two or three six four to five, and let's have a look now. The Otani fragment has a mixed agency Hebrew names of God and the archangel Rabiel. So uh, these are the, the, the agents that, that have the potency. These, these prayer amulets really function on the concept of potency, which the power of God or, 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 or other archangels, etc. Now the Hebrew names of God, uh, which is, as uh, you can see, it, uh, the Otani fragment, uh, the, and the, they're, they're very classic. They, they occur in commonly in incantation texts from the 6th and 7th century and right down to the 19th century amulets from, from uh, the Christian communities in Mesopotamia. The Hebrew names of God occur in another scroll amulet, which is now in the Hermitage, uh, published recently by Dickens and Smilova on line 22. The Otani fragment also cites Rabiel, the archangel, uh, uh, unusual because the archangel is usually Gabriel and Michael, um, and as quoted as that, such by the Hermitage um, uh, strip. Um, the name remains unidentified. Rabar, of course, great yell of God, so maybe the great one of God. Um, that's just a stab, I guess. There are many unidentified archangels. They seem to be quite fond of archangels. We have uh, Sarah Kael, the archangel, uh, which Dickens published in his article in a kick material in a Christian text from Turfan in the Acta Orientalia Hungarica. So, uh, but coming back to the previous Syriac HT 102 and 364 to 5 don't use such um, don't use such agencies and I uh, I am wondering um, why this might be so um, and in HT uh, in the Otani fragment the, the the client or the practitioner is active he it says I drive away you over uh, 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 you evil spirit. So um, compared to Syriac HT 102 and the N364, where it is all power is vested, the saint prays to God. Here you have a very active element by um, I presume the practitioner who writes the 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 the. the the, the, the prayer amulet. The Hermitage material uh, is, is passive and adopts the third person. May he be loosened. I have a couple of images, courtesy of Mark, who very kind of Mark Dickens, who finally, uh, not, not finally, who, who very kindly sent them to me. Um, so I haven't really been able to see close up, but they, I've only seen a few um, examples apart from the publication. And it says, if a person has written a spell against a client, this is the, the, the translation of Dickens and Smilova. If a person has written on gold, may he be loosened. And it repeats this for silver, bronze, lead, iron, and earth, a pottery vessel, and the leaf of a tree, which I wonder whether it might be um, paper. And it cites many, um, many biblical para uh, parallels and a wide range of pericopes. Now, the material Syriac HT 102 and N364-5 um, and the Otani uh, fragments don't 
carry these parallels, but we do have that sort of repertoire in another set of uh, fragments, which I am not mentioning today, which have been identified as the anathema of paradise. So it is known at Torofan, but it doesn't happen in the, the Cyprian manuscripts. Of course, the Hermitage manuscript is not uh, uh, specifically to Cyprian, so it might, it's a different genre. Um, and I just give you a snippet from one of the, uh, I think it's Syriac HT, yes, it's Syriac HT 114. And that just says, um, quoting Isaiah 38, five, Hezekiah's prayer. And you can see here uh, the um, uh, he he Hezekiah, with the Rabasa vocalizing the proper name as King Hezekiah prayed and his life was extended 15 years. That's very common. This also appears much later um, in, in the 19th century material, but that's beyond the scope of this talk. So both Syriac HT 99 and 102 are clearly antagonistic to magic, i.e. sorcery and divination. Uh, here you have a specific reference to magic sorceries on line six of HT 99. And in 102, we, ha um, uh, we have um, and lines eight to nine, you dissolved, and there's the, the nice verb for dissolved, Peshar, Peshin um, Resh, you dissolved all divinations and augurers. The um, the Turafan, uh, sorry, the the Hermitage fragment says also and it, it, it repeatedly line sixteen, line nineteen to twenty. So may the bonds of sorcery be loosened from he who puts on this amulet, and so may and then there's a lacuna be loosened from the chains of the bonds of sorcery. So there's a very clear reference to sorcery. These, these, these items are written uh, uh, to protect the person from sorcery. Um, uh, the Otani fragment is not quite as specific. It just says um, on verso lines eight to nine, all hideous, evil and hateful deeds. Um, and then it, it, it talks about fevers and shivers and these evil and accursed spirits. So it isn't quite as categoric, but we do have categoric references in these, these fragments to, to um, sorcery to, uh, against them. So the codex, looking at the codex form, Syriac HT 102 might be suggested to be a handbook for writing individual prayer amulets. There's no, uh, it doesn't include any names in, 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 the, in the exemplar. Perhaps it was for monastic use as a template for individual works. The strips or scrolls, I think are personal items. And this is sometimes indicated within the, um, within the fragment. Um, for example, the Otani uh, records on recto line 11, and here you can see underlined in the red. Oops, I have to go back. What happened? Underlined in the red, um, PLN, P Lama Nun, so and so, shorthand for so and so. Takahashi has pointed out that the copyist should have inserted the name of the client here. So he's using some sort of exemplar that has Palan, but he might not, uh, and, and indeed you would normally expect to find that as we will see with the Hermitage uh, fragment, but he might not have chosen to do so if the text was written for a non-specific client. We really know nothing about how these texts were commissioned. It might have been a stock text that he wrote and then sold to somebody. And I assume it's a he because 
that would be the way society functioned and sold it to somebody. But anyway, it is clearly an abbreviation where the name should be, but it indicates an individual application. The Hermitage uh, strip um, on line 16, 19, you can see multiple lines, names the client who has an, an uh, urgent, uh, and it's clearly a, a, a Uyghur or a Turkic speaker for whom the prayer amulet was written and his name is, is, is frequently mentioned. So we do have the recipient. Uh, Syriac HT gives 99, gives no indication of the client, but it is a cut down text that has been tailored as a prayer amulet. So um, we wouldn't expect to find the client's name. What is the criterion for selecting it as a prayer amulet is of course an interesting question, but it's clearly a longer text that has been recycled. In 364 to five, um, and here you have, and I'm not quite sure of the reading, but the, the Nun Tao Lamed combination that hangs on him, your servant, um, may also suggest a personal application. After all, I think this is a very personal uh, item um, in, in, because of its, its format. And we have, uh, finally, we have, sorry, uh, Syriac HT152, which I haven't mentioned, but it is two words flanking, written vertically, flanking across, and it says, for your handmade uh, healing. And this was found at Torfan uh, in, the, in the monastery, who the handmaid was uh, is, 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 of course, unknown, but it indicates female, uh, a, a female recipient. And so that, that's, of course, takes a different dimension to the previous examples where we think that, well, Uchunch would have been a male. But the, so, and we do know in antiquity that uh, they were, these items weren't uh, gender specific, but we obviously need to have more, uh, more detailed uh, evidence. Now, they were clearly used by the populace at Turfan and at other places, Karakoto. The majority are written in Syriac, but we have some Sogdian and Uyghur examples. Uh, N396 is Sogdian, but clearly modeled on a Syriac Vorlager and uh, U328, which Dickens has described as having an embedded magical text to be used for corralling a horse, his long article that I have just mentioned, written in Uyghur. Syriac, uh, and here I, 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 I had thought about the use of Syriac, of course, it was a prestige language, it was the language of the Church of the East, it had uh, more than prestige, it had potency beyond the vernacular. Uh, and it was linked to the liturgy. Uh, it was uh, it, it, so Syriac was linked to the liturgy, and the prayer amulets were paraliturgical. In, in that, that that's my understanding of how they function. If we look at the liturgy, and I just want to do a very brief excursus excursus into the liturgy, we find requests for protection and to stave off illness are often found in such works. And remembering, we have huge, we have hundreds of uh, fragments in Torfan that are liturgical, and we still haven't translated all of them. So this is an aspect that is worthy of further exploration, looking at what, what material in the liturgy might translate into a paraliturgical context. We have from the Vespers and Compline from an Office of Martyrs, uh, a biling from a bilingual service book we have, you can see here, and I've, I've, I've just circled it in red, uh, Mar Sergius and Mar Bacchus, of course, very famous saints uh, throughout uh, the church, right from Mesopotamia through to through to um, Torfan, the power prevails over all which is released by the bones, protects our souls by night and day. And this is a public expression of um, 
protection. The prayer amulets I I I, I translate as individual um, on an individual uh, level of protection. At times, the boundaries are not uh, are blurred, and it's not easy to discern how a text was used, whether as a prayer or an amulet. It's an artificial distinction. And here I show a delightful fragment. It was truly a delight to discover this Syriac HT386, again found a Gauchong, according to the, 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 the Torfan uh, uh, class mark. And it was Psalm 1848, 1 to 3, written in, uh, sorry, 1 to 6, written in reverse sequence. Why, we don't actually know, but anyway, was, the prayer, was, was this fragment a prayer, an amulet, a scribble, trying out your pen, a scribal exercise? We just don't know. And it is a very rough hand, as you can see, uh, on a rough piece of paper. And it seems to have been bespoke because on the other side, and I've put the little insert in, is the, the, the face drawn around the hole, which was in the paper already. So um, already using damaged paper. But you know, why do you write it in reverse? And we just don't know. But it's an interesting and, and, and delightful example. If we pass on now, so some of the strip amulets show signs of folding. Uh, you can see Syriac HT 99 folded into three. The cross is in a central part. Syriac HT 152 and 99 may have been carried as personal items, the little, little fragment with the cross. The dimensions of the Otani fragment and N364 to 5 are likewise, but the Hermitage fragment was very long, 89.5 centimetres by 7. Now, 89.5 centimetres, I'm afraid I'm imperial. Um, it translates to about three foot. So it's very long and it's uh, quite exceptional in the fact of its length. So we don't know whether it is atypical or whether there were other examples, but we, we do have this one. Now Dickens and Smilova note that the strip was folded se several times. Um, it roughly equal intervals, lines 8 to 9, 19 to 20, etc., 29 to 30. Uh, 39 between 48 and to 9, 57 to 8, and 67 to 8. And um, I think if those of you who've got very sharp eyes can just see above uh, 68, that looks to me like a fold. I haven't had clear enough images to see, but I take their word. Now, and they, as they say, probably in a style resembling. Chinese harmon ha harmonica books. And of course, uh, Professor Galamos knows much, much more about that than I do. But it's interesting, this very long and uh, 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 this very long strip, which is why I have changed. Only uh, doing a paper always challenges you to think, and previously I'd always called them scrolls. But I think they should uh, these 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 strips these items should be called strips. But it's a very long, and that's what they think. Now, of course, the 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 terminology, and I haven't had the time to go into the long uh, the long contents of the Hermitage. Uh, strip, but it imports Mesopotamian material that is common in incantation bowls dated to the 6th, 7th century. This passed into the Christian repertoire. Um, it's something I will look at in a future paper at Paris, how this does actually pass into the Christian repertoire using incantation bowls. And it's essentially the actions, the binding and the loosening, such an important action. But it's clearly situated within the Christian repertoire. Um, the robust heritage of martyrdoms, Old Testament paradigms, archangels, even if they are ones we've not heard of, saints, Mary, Joseph, uh, Gospel, and the Trinity. 
And it, 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 you find this material is enculturated to the religious matrix in which it is embedded. Uh, I can't go into that in much more detail, but I have found this in working with the incantation balls that they, they reflect the religious matrix of the client society. So these are clearly embedded in a Christian context at Turafan. They're antithetical to sorcery, magic, and other malevolent forces, and they act in a prophylactic and preventative capacity. So they are paraliturgical in function. And I refute the definition offered by Bohark and many other scholars that they are magical. I do not think that that actually reflects the, the function in which the users use them. We may consider them that, but I don't think the users did, but they are paraliturgical. I think that's an appropriate term. Now, the, the, they were clearly used by the Sogdian and Uyghur populace. How do we relate the codex and the strip prayer amulet formats, i.e. Do we have an individual versus monastic application? These are questions that uh, one asks because we really don't know who was writing these uh, items. It may not be just as I, I have to say, I previously thought they emanated from a monastic environment, but that may not be the case. They may, they may have practitioners within the Christian environment who writes them. We just simply don't know. Now, um, so, so as I said, implications for who were the copyists. Certainly, uh, the, these, these items are very important for being windows into the vernacular articulation of belief. And they're also important, I think, for showing the um, adaptation of the codex into possibly um, the, the, the local form of writing on strips. Uh, Professor Columbus might have some more comment on that, but why are individual um, why are individual prayer amulets written in a, a strip form rather than a codex? Does that indicate the sort of usage in society? And of course, what they are valuable also for, and we've always got this question of where were the liturgical manuscripts written at Bulaik because they're in a lovely standard hand, rather like biblical Hebrew, whether it's 8th century or 15th century, very hard to date it because it's such a regular hand, very hard to know locality because, again, of such a regular hand. But the, that these, am, these prayer amulets that are written in situ um, are, are certainly give us, even if the handwriting is very poor in terms of quality of, 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 of the writing. They give us, they give us first-hand insight into the paleography at Tura Farm. So um, just wrapping up, um, we have a growing repertoire which wasn't of material from Tura Farm that I'm happy to say is attracting increasing interest and probably um, until the Tura Farm material was actually catalogued now back 10 years ago, et cetera. We, we, we really had no idea of this very rich source of information about the communities who lived and worshiped at Tura Farm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erica. Um, for the ve very interesting and stimulating talk. And um, perhaps you could unshare your screen now and I'll That's stop the recording. Yeah, right, okay, right. I'll stop, I'll stop the recording.